Doc on the Run. We help injured runners run. Today on the Doc on the Run podcast, we're talking with Jonathan Ellsworth, and he's the founder and editor-in-chief of Blister and the host of the Off the Couch podcast. And we're talking about how you can assess running gear reviews, decide when we should try something new, and how sometimes new gear isn't really always better just because it happens to be different. So Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. I'm happy to be here. All right, listen, before we get into some of the direct questions about gear reviews, about how we can assess gear reviews, you know, decide if we really need run, new running gear and all that sort of stuff, maybe you could just give us a little bit of your kind of personal background with running and athletics and, and how you became so interested in gear reviews. Yeah. So uh, I grew up in Chicago and, uh, you know, my loves back then as a kid, soccer, basketball, and football uh, were kind of the three. And uh, this is one of the things that we actually talk a decent amount about on Off the Couch is, you know, turns out as a kid, I was running all the time, but I was chasing a ball, right? You know, so I never thought of myself as a runner as a kid. Um, and um, basketball and football kind of won out as uh, kind of my obsessions in middle school, high school and, and the like. And uh, it was actually in high school, uh, I did actually, I was on the track and field team and I was a sprinter. I ran the 100 and 200, but full disclosure, the only reason I was there was because it was kind of good training for football and just doing speed work and the rest. So it's funny, um, my running background is not what I sort of think of as conventional. Um, again, I mean, I, I was playing sports, I felt, I think like eight to 10 hours a day, certainly in the summer, but that running was always on a basketball court or a soccer field or on a football field. I wasn't, you know, I, I didn't run cross country and, uh, and I wasn't running long distances. So that's a, that's a bit of kind of my background. I, I ended up uh, going to college for football and, uh, you know, again, full disclosure, I, I kind of was that person who would be like oh god running running is dumb right why would you run you know and uh you know looking back i definitely kind of cringe at some of those statements but but that's true that's really where i was coming from and um you know fast forward um post college and the rest i ended up uh moving out west and that's really when i started playing in the mountains a lot and so skiing and mountain biking and climbing and doing a bit of trail running mm -hmm. though admittedly again there's gonna be a lot of admissions and confessions here uh you know i i was i did not sort of instantly become a trail runner or anything like that now fast forward a little further um this is actually coming up on uh three years ago uh i was backcountry skiing uh, it was my birthday actually in july Mm -hmm. And uh, it was backcountry skiing on Independence Pass outside of Aspen. I was with some friends and it was, you know, there's like a strip of snow, uh, but this, it's July. I mean, it was, you know, it was quite warm out. Um, actually ended up having a really terrible accident that day on my birthday and uh, broke my neck severely and, and really should have been dead. And um, was very lucky, had some, a great crew of friends with me. Um, didn't die, but uh, and didn't end up paralyzed after they installed a bunch of hardware in my neck. Um, but uh, it was really after that injury when you know my surgeon was like, Please don't do anything like at all. I don't, you know, his, his only concern as a surgeon was he didn't want this hardware to get ripped out, and um, so the only thing I could do uh, was walk in, in you know, a cervical collar. And then eventually that got ramped up to extremely light jogging. And then eventually that kind of transformed like this single kind of athletic thing I could do was run. Mm -hmm. And that was truly the first time in my life when running didn't become like the punishment thing that you had to do at the end of a football practice or something. Running became freeing. Mm -hmm. And that is really the moment for me. And so, yeah, this was only, you know, it wasn't even three years ago. That was really the moment when running 
kind of opened up this world and it became a lifeline for me. Right. Yeah. And uh, I'm in some very, actually in a number of ways, I'm sort of grateful for that accident um, because it did open up a whole new world and kind of perspective and an appreciation. And uh, that's kind of my, uh, I guess, long ish backstory with running. Oh, it's interesting. And, and, you know, you bring up a good point, right? Like in high school, uh, a lot of uh, football players are also successful track athletes. That's mm-hmm. not really that complicated. If you're running back, it makes sense that you could run fast on a track. I mean, you yeah. have to run faster than everyone on the field if you want to be successful in football. And so there is a lot of crossover that way. But of course, we do hear like over and over on podcasts, you know, really incredibly successful runners who really did you know, run cross country in high school and college and so on, and then just continue to evolve from there. But that's not every runner's story. I talk to people all the time that didn't begin running until they were 40. Uh, You know, when I was uh, into climbing really big, people used to ask me all the time, you know, do you like hiking? And I was like, only if it's to the base of a climb. (laughs) To the crag. Uh, (laughs) <laughs> you know, but it wasn't, I, I didn't go on hikes just for the sake of hikes. It was always to hike to get to something. And some of those hikes were really long, you know, but, the, but then you can transition into lots of other things from, you know, hiking to trail running and uh, cross country to trail running from track to trail running all, you know, and from basketball to trail running. And, yeah. you know, even in high school, I remember in uh, tennis, um, uh, soccer, uh, wrestling, all of them, we uh, were required to run. And I remember most of us, like particularly in wrestling, everybody was like, what in the world does running have to do with wrestling, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, but it is a great way to build aerobic fitness, obviously. And that can translate into many different things where either, you know, climbing fitness or uh, mountain biking or skiing or any of that stuff, all these backcountry pursuits, obviously running can supplement all of those things quite successfully. Yeah. Um, you know, so you never know, but it doesn't really matter how we all get to running. It's like, if you enjoy running, that's great. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know, right now, things are chaos, right? Like you're in Colorado. Um, it's, uh, I think it just like you got, got dumped on just recently, yeah. right? Yeah. And so, yeah, so Crested Butte's a great place. And um, there are a lot of really, you know, interesting people live or train there, right? Uh, and uh, let me just hold you there. This, this community, there are so many badasses here. It is mm-hmm. unbelievable right. from from trail runners to mountain bikers to skiers and the rest, I'm, it, is, it is astonishing. And every day I meet somebody new and uh, th- it's just another remarkable person. So it's, it's, uh, it's both wonderful and very humbling. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's, it's got to be interesting to be out for a run and see Emma Coburn go by, right? Yeah, like, right. I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, I'm sure it's like really bizarre to be in that environment, but that gives you all these great opportunities, right? So you have, you know, not just obviously world-class runners, uh, but you have all these outdoor sports all kind of rolled into one. So um, what are you doing right now? Like for fun, for, for, you know, entertainment, for athletics, what do you do to supplement uh, the running stuff right now? How does that all kind of look like? Well, uh, so yesterday um, we're doing a lot of, of backcountry skiing right now. And uh, you know, to be clear, in this time of COVID and the rest, I guess it is important to say um, we are following all, you know, local ordinances and the rest and practicing social distancing and, and all of those things and being, you know, very cognizant um, in terms of the decision making and the like. Um, but, you know, um, I'm, I'm extraordinarily grateful to be in a place right now. Um, we have an ocean of backcountry terrain, you know, and uh, so we were out on a, a six hour tour yesterday and it was absolutely gorgeous. And I say it every time I, I go and I'm fortunate to go skiing, um, it's, it is still very much my therapy, you know. Uh, I, I think for me, kind of in particular, while I feel really good when I go out for a run and I feel like I get kind of give myself a thumbs up, like great mission accomplished. Um, right now, you know, you, you walk up a big tall mountain like we did yesterday, but that freedom and the speed and kind of just the joy of downhill skiing, that is actually my therapy. And, and uh, so right now um, tis the season and we're taking, in, taking advantage of these spring snowstorms for sure. Yeah, that's great. 
All right. So what about schedules? I mean, like you said, you mentioned this is a a crazy time, uh, lots of restrictions, you know, uh, I mean, in Tahoe, they actually had to post things saying don't ski uphill at the resorts you're trespassing because so many people were going out there anyway they were not following the rules uh, and then kind of ruin it for everybody in Marin County they closed these enormous areas of the Marin headlands because people simply would not follow the rules and so they said okay you can't go at all and now up there if you go and park and try to go run on those trails you will get a ticket because you're not supposed to be there so if you literally park anywhere near them on the side of the road you'll get fined um, but you know, that's because everything's in chaos, right? People's races have been canceled. Flights have been canceled. Travel has been eliminated. Uh, and everybody is confused about what to do. So I'm just curious if you have anything on the calendar now, if you have any kind of goal event or something that was coming up that you've had to shift and, and, you know, what you're going to do in exchange for that, uh, that goal has been postponed or maybe eliminated. Yeah. Um, funny you ask, um, my my April and May were going to arguably be um, kind of, I guess if you ever had a, like a dream April, May, this would be that. Right. And so I was actually, uh, I was supposed to have been at the start of April uh, in Girdwood, Alaska. Oh. Uh, I have never been to Alaska. One of my best friends and one of our, our senior reviewers lives in Girdwood. And it was going to be a combination um, backcountry ski trip and heli ski trip. And then I'm actually, I was supposed to be in France right now uh, on a backcountry ski trip. And then uh, there is a trip to Iceland at the beginning of May that is looking, you know, very doubtful at the moment. Um, And uh, so, yeah. Uh, there's a little bit of, <laughs> you know, yeah. all in all, I, you know, I think at any day you're alive, be grateful and 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 find the th- find the stuff to be grateful for. But, um, you know, but yeah, this this would have been, I mean, for for me for sure. I mean, um, just a spectacularly interesting uh, season. And so, uh, you know, again, um, all that said, yesterday to be out with a couple good friends in the mountains, um, I, I I couldn't be more thankful for for those opportunities, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I think I'm probably like a lot of people, um, you know, using this time right now to kind of double down on strength work um, just at the house. And uh, uh, it was really interesting. I've, I've lifted, I've actually lifted weights. I I started when I was like 11 or 12 years old, which is kind of weird. But um, for the first time in my life, I have, I've never bought like an actual legit professional grade dumbbell set. Mm -hmm. And I did when I saw kind of this COVID wave coming and I thought, yeah, my, my gym here is going to get closed. And, and, um, and, and to be honest, like I've kind of been loving that, like having this access to good equipment and getting these workouts in. And, and I think again, if I, if I have anything, um, probably not that smart, but, um, I think, uh, valuable to say. Um, I think we all just always have to kind of try to think through like, what are our present circumstances and what is the opportunity here? Right. I mean, and I think that if we're, if we're going to have any modicum of success at life, um, you know, for me, the mantra that I kind of tell myself, and and honestly, this did develop after I broke my neck skiing almost died. But, um, I think like, I just say to myself, like, everything is an opportunity. And I think the onus is on me every day, you know, trips get canceled or I can't go do this. Okay. Now take a minute, think through hard. What, what is the opportunity here? And, um, you know, it doesn't mean that things are always easy. Um, but I do think that's our job is to figure, is to figure that out. And, you know, um, that's what I'm trying to do right now in terms of specific like goals Honestly, this sounds I this might sound like a cop out answer. I know that you probably talk to a lot of folks who, you know, are like, well, I'm I'm really working on, you know, speed work right now. I'm or I'm I'm really working on like my my longer distance, you know, uh cardio and pace, that kind of thing. Honestly, right now, and the more I'm kind of being uh, you know, uh willfully dragged in deeper and deeper into this running world, I swear the biggest thing for me is 
I don't want to lose that uh, feeling that I described from a few years back to, to, um, to let running become less than an act of freedom. Yeah. I, and so I'm just not about, and you know, my co-host on off the couch, Brendan Leonard, he's kind of always on my case. Like, when are you going to start, you know, tracking Strava and, and that kind of thing? And I'm like, not today, yeah. you know, like I, people who want to do that, that's great. And, and to track goals, I think is great. But honestly, my goal right now is like, I don't want to lose this sort of newfound freeing relationship um, that I have with running and, and that's actually my goal. So, yeah. And that's interesting. I mean, you bring up a couple of really interesting points there. One of them is like, it has to be this, you know, enjoying running is should in itself should be a goal. I mean, mm -hmm. it sounds silly, but it really should. And I had a coach one time that she actually, um, prohibited me from listening to, um, podcasts, uh, business, audio books, um, anything like that, anything that involved like actual attention span and learning. And she, and she would say like, basically running is your, your meditation, you know, and you need to be able to actually be fully present in that experience to get the full benefit from it. Sounds obvious. I mean, but you know, that's not what we always do. And, um, and, you know, and it's, so we have sometimes have to stay focused on that stuff. And, and also like talking about, you know, how you can take the circumstances you have, even if it seems like an adverse circumstance and still use it and get stronger as an athlete. And you know, the other day is really interesting. We were looking through, um, which is kind of really funny, but we we're looking through Netflix, um, at different shows and we found, and I had actually just ordered a home gym and it was like turned out because I did not think about it as the trouble started. When the trouble started, you know, because we're both doctors, we ordered medical equipment, right? Shields, masks, gloves, shoe covers, whatever, tons of it so that we would be covered if we, you know, ran out, you know, obviously we need to be really and truly covered. And um, so we got that stuff, but I didn't think that far ahead with like home gym equipment. And, and so I was trying to order that. It was very difficult. You know, I would put it in the shopping cart, get ready to click order. And then it would say, you know, ships June 15th to August 15th. I'm like, what are you talking about? I don't even want this then, you know? Um, and it was difficult. And so then you start thinking like, well, you know, you have all these routines, right? Like we go get coffee at the coffee shop. We go out to eat, we go to the gym and we think we need all those things, but we're learning pretty quickly. We really don't. And what I found on Netflix was it was a series called convict conditioning. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of funny because they pose it as uh, they say, you know, that it's almost this lost art of people um, who have, you know, are prisoners who have learned how to stay incredibly fit using only body weight exercises. Mm -hmm. And so they go through actually like the proper technique for doing push ups and how you make a progression from doing regular push ups to one handed push ups, from doing pull ups to doing one handed pull ups and all this stuff. And, you know, and the truth is you don't need an entire gym we're spoiled, you know, we can go to the gym and, you know, pay a very low fee to go every single day of every month and use very specific machines that target muscles very individually. But the truth is, is you can do some simple exercises and get really, really fit. Yeah. And you can do that at home. You do not have to have a gym. Yeah. Um, you don't have to sit on the machine and check your Instagram feed, you yeah. know, uh, which is what half the people are doing in the gyms. And yeah. it is interesting. Um, you know, how it gives us this opportunity, whether you love running or not, you can still stay fit during this time. Yeah. Uh, but you did bring that up about how some runners love running. Some people don't, some people, um, you know, will say what, like, um, you know, that they're, they're, they only kind of like running, I think is how you put it. And, um, and yeah. sometimes there's truthfully, some of us will openly admit that we just hate running. I've got yeah. one of my best friends. He'll tell you, he hates running. Um, and another guy, one of my cycling buddies, he, every time I would invite him to go on a run with me, he would say, Chris, people are only supposed to run to evade capture. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, but that's right. It's like, so, so he's not going to do it no matter what. Um, but you know, I know that you get lots of different guests on your podcast, uh, who actually do sometimes, you know, fall into one of those, those three groups. And so how do you, you know, how do you go about finding those uh, guests on your podcast? Yeah. I mean, I think that, I mean, a big part of it is I've got kind of the people on my radar who I, um, you know, in the running world who I thought it'd be really interesting to talk to this person or that person. And then, um, you know, we, we definitely are, are talking, you know, 
multiple times a week with our with our group of runners and with my uh, with my co-host Brendan Leonard, and we're we've got a pretty good, I guess I'd say, feel for mm-hmm. the type of, um, I guess I don't know, general programming and people and events and topics that we are interested in talking um, mm-hmm. about, and um, and so I don't know. So far, it's felt actually really organic, and um, I'm I'm just not afraid, I guess. Um, I guess I sometimes, I think ultimately, um, my interest is not in trying to every, with every single episode, appeal to every one of those different groups. I just think that, I mean, honestly, the thing that motivates me the most is like, you very much hope that others also find, uh, you know, something valuable, um, or something funny, uh, in that conversation. But I really think that's it. And, and I, I am a big, uh, I guess I have a lot of faith in sort of the, the power and the value of good conversation. And I mean, I just feel like at the end of the day, um, if you've got a couple interesting and engaging people having a back and forth, um, there is going to be value to emerge in that conversation. And so, you know, some days um, or some episodes, I'll say of off the couch, it will be you know, we will get into a little bit of the weeds of like, um, you know, race strategy or, Mm -hmm. um, you know, tactical stuff. Um, And uh, other, I mean, we actually are just about to post a conversation with uh, Scott and Jenny Jurek. Mm. And we mostly mostly talked about cooking the whole time. And it was (laughs) hilarious. And I had no clue that the conversation was going to go that way. And there's going to definitely be some people that are like, wait, you had Scott and Jenny Jurek and you talked about cooking for like right. at least half the episode. And it's like, yes, we did. And right. it was, and it was great. And um, I don't know. I, I think that uh, I, I do think that sometimes the, the world of running um, it does feel like that world and sort of what counts or who counts as a runner that can start to feel pretty narrow Mm -hmm. and I have no interest in kind of perpetuating a kind of that kind of narrowing of what we might understand account as a runner or a top or a top a legit topic of conversation on a quote unquote running podcast. Um, I I'm um, you know, I'm kind of interested in, in uh, not staying too constrained on that front. So Yeah. yeah. No, that's good. I mean, there because there's so many different shows now, right? There are. And and so there are shows that specifically talk about you know who exactly is registered for and what their strengths are, what their year has been like, how they're going to do at Western States 100, why they think this new person is a contender at Western States 100, and that you know talk for over an hour just yeah. about their opinion on what they think these people might do in performance of one particular race. You know, yeah. there are people that have podcasts that talk about how to lose weight from running. There are people that talk about virtually everything um, yeah. on these topics. But, you know, again, it's interesting people that we get to have interesting conversations with. And you never know, um, yeah. you know, it, an industry leader, somebody who's clearly like a top level world class athlete. You never really know what you're going to get until you talk to those people because you never really know what they're going to be like. Yeah. And, um, you know, they just seem like these people seem like these untouchable figures, but then you have some conversation with them and they joke around and talk about, you know, cooking and that yeah. kind of stuff that makes them more human and more personal. And, and it, it is interesting because that's yeah. really the human element that people, you know, want to be connected to sometimes, not just race strategy. Yeah. Um, and yeah. by the way, for the record, I, I will say, I mean, there are times when I love getting into the weeds about yeah, right who, you know, and listening to some of these right. other podcasts or whatever about, you know, so-and-so's take on who they think is like coming in particularly strong for a Western right. state, or whatever. And so I think like, um, you know, I would be, I would be lying if I said that, that, that those sometimes weren't, you know, topics of conversation that were of interest to me, but right. I just feel like if we have a role or, and it, it, it mostly just felt like the natural thing I wanted to do is like, let's just kind of go broad with yeah, this. Yeah. And um, so it's, it's been super fun. I, I've, yeah. I've, uh, 
Um, we do a number of different podcasts at Blister, and um, I'm really proud of. Uh, it's kind of like all these different conversations, these collections of com conversations and really interesting and thoughtful people we've had and funny and stupid conversations we've had. Um, it's frankly kind of shaping up to be exactly what I wanted it to be yeah. for better or for worse. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's great. But you know, again, we don't really know what we're going to get out of these episodes when you get some guest on the show. And a lot of times we get guests because they seem famous or we're interested in them as a person and just want to ask them particular questions, but you never really know what's going to come out of that. And sometimes, you know, um, in that discussion with somebody that you have on the show, you get something really personal out of it. And so if you think about somebody that you've had on the show, uh, regardless of who it is, you know, what can you think of as a really interesting exchange where you actually drew something from it because it struck some kind of personal chord with you? Yeah. Um, this one, I knew you were going to ask me a version of this question. And, um, it's so funny. I, I, I find myself thinking about, you know, when you ask it, sort of the whole thing about if you asked a parent, like, who's your favorite child yeah. and you can't, I, I have, I have so enjoyed the conversations that we've had that it, it truly makes this pretty tough. Now I'm not going to dodge your question, but it might get a little <laughs> bit longer. Um, I, I First answer, um, we've had somebody on twice now, um, Sanjay Rawal, mm -hmm. and he was on episode two, and then I think maybe episode 37. Sanjay is mind-blowing. He is so smart. He is so funny and generous. He should be president of the United States. I would vote for him. Uh, he is a, a passionate runner. Um, I am blown away. Um, by his perspective, um, his thoughtfulness, how articulate he is, how, how articulate he is. Um, so Sanjay, um, and this is somebody who uh, my co-host Brendan Leonard knew, and so we had him on for episode two, and I was just, I was just dumbfounded, and um, and I'm happy to say Sanjay's become a friend of mine uh, since, and um, he's he's incredible, and I, I can't imagine anyone listening to Sanjay talk and not just being like. I need more of this guy in my life type of thing. Um, a couple more, I'll go quick. Um, but, it, and this was a really fun question for you to ask because I got to go back over sort of our catalog, but you know, we talked to, we talked to Claire Gallagher um, shortly after she won Western States and um, you know, Claire had just been out in the uh, Alaska national wildlife uh, preserve and listening to her really sincere um, uh, and committed principles on what is happening, um, what we're doing in the world, her kind of environmental concerns, agreeing to this trip to Anwar. And when like nobody would have told any, you know, serious competitive runner, this is a smart thing to do right before Western State. That was a remarkable conversation. And I think Claire's great. Um, one of my favorite conversations that we've had, um, I talked to Zach Bitter uh, right after Zach set the world record for running the fastest 100 mile time. Um, Zach broke down his preparation for that race, what exactly was happening during that in a way that was so, like it's one thing to be able to run 100 miles faster than anyone ever has, but to then be so good at breaking down and 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 uh, and analyzing, doing the kind of post op analysis of that, it was um, it was amazing, right? I, I think like any, it's like having any artist or athlete be able to kind of perfectly describe what was happening. I always find that kind of thing really really intriguing. Um, yeah. Uh, all right, I'll just go one more. I had I'd written down a couple others, but um, we had a guy named Eric Walker on. And um, Eric lives in Minnesota, and he is, and I mean this in the best possible sense of the term, he's a very normal guy. And, um, but he did something pretty not normal, which is Eric ran five kilometers for over 365 days in a row. Mm -hmm. And he just said, decided he was going to do that you know, one day and he started doing it and he, you know, has a blog and he kind of started documenting it a bit. And this is just one of those things like, you know, 
I think in a wonderful lesson, kind of inspiration that we don't have to be anybody or possess any kind of superpower, but just decide, you know, I'll run five kilometers every single day without fail. Mm-hmm. And, um, and talking with Eric was fantastic. And so that's just, it gives people perhaps a range of, of, uh, of kind of some of the conversations we've had and, and, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm grateful for all of them. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's so many, you know, interesting people and also truthfully, it's like all these things that we find incredible are because they're unusual. Right. And even if somebody says they're not even worried about the pace, they're not even really worried about the distance that much. It's just going to be more than 5k, but they're going to do it every single day without, without fail for a year is really hard to achieve because the truth is, is that, you know, we're not stuck to consistency anymore. We have pretty cush lives uh, in the world that we live in now. We can kind of do or not do anything that we want for the most part and still survive. And consistency is rare today. And uh, I know there's a guy on another show who he posted a thing and it's basically it's this challenge and it's not really that hard, except you have to do every one of these things for 75 days in a row. And when he started, he's just, he basically just says, look, every one of you people listening right now, I'll bet you right now, I bet a million dollars that 90% of you will not even come close to finishing this. And I'm not even telling you what you have to do. Yep. And it's true because, you know, it's really difficult to do just these very simple things every day, but consistency does pay off, you know? Uh, I mean, there are some people that will say consistency is their secret weapon. You know, we all have things that we think of as like, why we avoid injury, why we recover really quickly, why we're actually successful at some athletic pursuit. It's because we have what we think is the one thing that really holds us together. And sometimes maybe that's the the thing is like, I have this recovery sort of smoothie that I make every time I do a workout. If I go to the track, I take it worth with me. I literally like have it on the side of the track. And when I finish, I drink it while I'm doing my cool down. Uh, When I would do a race, I would actually make it, you know, at three o'clock in the morning, pack it on ice and have it there for when I would actually finish the race. And, you know, whether or not that actually really matters that much, I don't know, but I know I've done it consistently. But some, you know, some people think it's naps when they're tired. Some people think it's acupuncture, massage, whatever. I'm just curious, though. I know you basically obviously had to overcome and recover from a truly dangerous, debilitating injury. And you did. So you're active, you're outdoors, you're enjoying the world, you know, in your way athletically. um, And you had to recover to do that. Now that obviously forces you into some choices you didn't want. You know, you weren't going out and doing backcountry skiing. You were going for a walk with a cervical collar on. And that's not something you chose, but you adapted. And now that you've, you know, kind of evolved out of that adaptation to this force limitation on exercise, uh, you can do anything you want. But when you train now, if you're going to keep, you know, doing stuff and have the kind of travel schedule that you had planned for April and May between all of those outdoor activities, you have to recover if you're going to keep doing it and not get an injury. So I'm curious, like if you think of sort of what it is that you do as your sort of secret weapon for recovery between those things, what would that be? Mm. Um, That's a good question. I mean, I, you know, it is kind of given the nature of what we do at Blister, which is where doing these product reviews um, year round, uh, nonstop in, you know, we're reviewing ski equipment and mountain bike equipment and running equipment and climbing equipment. And Mm -hmm. now I'm not, I'm not a lead reviewer on all of that stuff. We've got a a great team and they're amazing at what they do, but I do kind of have a hand at least in sort of all of these areas. And um, so, yeah, I mean, one, we live in Crested Butte, Colorado, um, which is a pretty good spot for outdoor activity. And then two, given the nature of my job, right, um, I'm sort of, I have to be out, right? Yeah. Um, so I think for me, um, you know, I, I think a big part of it is um, diet for me is a pretty big one. And some people will laugh who, who know me. Um, it's real, real streamlined. But I still kind of find for me, like, after a big day in the mountains yesterday, like, I was wiped out. I mean, I was tired from from that tour, um, you know, making sure I'm kind of eating the right stuff, um, pre-tour, post-tour, and then today, um, that that is something I pay a lot of attention to, even if I keep it pretty, like, you know, there's a lot of protein powder in water. 
uh, type of thing. I, I don't, I don't really have the time or the inclination to get too fancy with some of this stuff, yeah. but I think um, being kind of smart about some of the carbs and some of the vegetables. And, and I always have kind of been um, uh, trying to stay pretty specific about kind of protein intake. Um, and then after that, honestly, being pretty smart about stretching. Mm. Um, and I don't do, nothing I do is kind of like exorbitant. It's all, yeah. it's, I, I, I want bang for the buck. Um, and then um, I already mentioned the, the strength training I'm doing. Um, and a lot of that, I honestly, I do think one of the reasons why, um, this backcountry ski accident that I was involved in, um, one of the reasons why maybe I didn't get paralyzed in that accident was I do attribute a lot of that to the strength training I had been doing for years and years and years in advance. Right. Um, you know, and then I think the biggest thing for me when running, um, is I've gotten, I've gotten, um, boy, it sounds really lame to admit this out loud. Um, if I start getting that tweak in my knee, or if I start feeling like an Achilles tendon tighten up, I don't push through that yeah. anymore. I, I'm not, I'm not out here trying to win a race, right? Like I'm, this is for long haul fitness for me. Right. And so those things I have just increasingly come to respect, like you start getting that twang, that tweak, get to a walk. And, and almost always, you know, I can like sort of, you know, go to a walk and maybe the, you know, maybe the, the 5k or, or 10k run that I'm supposed to be on. Turns out I just walked, you know, 15 minutes of a section and will sometimes be like, okay, that actually seems to have subsided. Um, and let's, let's try to slowly conservatively ramp back in and see if we can finish out this run. But if it's not, I, I don't, I don't push through stuff when it comes specifically to running, if it's dealing with my knee or like, or frankly, an Achilles, yeah. um, those are, those are no, those are no push through things for me. Yeah, no, that's good advice. I mean, for sure. And I think that, um, you know, there's only a couple of ways that you're going to learn about running injuries is that you ignore those things. And then you yeah. get to suffer with one or you listen to other people that have been through it. And, you know, the longer you run, the easier it is to start to identify these little things that you notice as a tight Achilles, you know, issue yeah. kind of beginning to crop in that just does not seem normal. It is yeah. not right. It's different than the generalized soreness you get after a hard session. Uh, yeah. It is different. And if, if, if you want to be an endurance athlete, you have to be able to endure. And that means yeah. being able to exercise regularly too. So if you try to fight for, through one of those things and then you get injured, you're completely screwed. That's the bottom line, you yeah. know, because nobody becomes a se successful athlete by having a massive buildup for months and then taking weeks off for an injury. It doesn't yeah. really serve you well. Uh, uh, and, and, and again, for what I'm doing, um, again, I, maybe I'd have a slightly different outlook, but I don't really think so. If, if, if I was a professional runner and it was yeah. like, yeah, I'm out here trying to get on the podium of this 50k or 100k or whatever but um i just man that's just something um I, I running for me is um a long haul activity and a really key component of my fitness and and therefore my overall happiness yeah. and so um you know i'm i'm trying to be good for the long haul and and i've just come to learn for me like if i'm running and something's coming up like that I respect that. And, and again, I, I guess I've been lucky to some extent. Um, if I am dealing with a knee thing or an Achilles, um, next day I'm walking. Yeah. And I've, again, I, you know, I, I really have, I've really learned to love like walking and when I'm running tur turns out, apparently I'm, you know, I should get in better shape or something. Cause I'm not sitting there when I'm actually on a trail run, having these amazing thoughts of, you know, about life and it's not creative. I'm like, all right, man, you know, watch this footwork and like, this is getting hard, keep it going. Um, but walking, I feel like there's this kind of creative explosion. Mm -hmm. And so in a way that's kind of been a nice thing for me is that I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that I'm not somebody, I know these people who are like, if I'm not running, I don't feel right. Like I'm not good. I'm going to try to push through that injury. 
for me, um, not running means I'm walking and walking is this like, it's like a drug. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I don't have a good, I don't, have, I don't do drugs, but man, in terms of like mind expansion and the kind of create the creative thinking that happens when I'm just out in a beautiful walk around here, um, pretty good. So that's yeah. real basic uh, recovery strategy, I suppose, but it's been effective so far. No, that's great. I think that's really good advice. You know, that's really the key, right? It's like listen to your body, know what works, know where you get, you know, like you say, that fuel, the inspiration. And you really do when your mind kind of opens up during activity, that's a pretty amazing thing. Um, but it's uh, certainly important to be able to recognize it and recognize when you're overdoing it too. Yeah. I want to kind of shift to some of the review stuff because obviously yeah. that is your area. And, um, you know, when I lecture at medical conferences multiple times a year, so I, I go, I basically teach physicians how to help injured runners yeah. achieve their goals is the bottom line. And when I lecture, sometimes it's very specific topics like stress fractures. Sometimes it's uh, about how the standard of care in medicine actually makes athletes worse. And I believe makes them more prone to other overtraining injuries later. Um, but there's this really important thing that we're all required to do when we lecture at medical conferences, because this is where physicians go to get their continuing medical ed education credits that they're required to get in order to maintain board certification status and in order to maintain a state license to practice medicine. They have to go get that training. So obviously when they do that, we have a responsibility to be ethical and prevent present information that's actually useful, but not biased. And yeah. Uh, so we have a, a disclosure slide at, that we're given. We're like, this is the disclosure side. The rest of your talk can be whatever you want, but you have to use this exact format for the, the disclosure side that reveals any potential conflict of interest that you have that could skew the opinion stated in your talk. And then we also separately have to sign a form that meets uh, continuing medical education credentialing requirements as well as the FDA to make sure that we're not providing, you know, recommendations for drugs or medical devices off label that, you know, might sound like a good idea, but there's no evidence for it. So we're very limited in how we can actually present that information to physicians and medical conferences. Now, obviously, if a doctor is being sponsored by a drug company and then spends all their time on stage talking about how wonderful the drug is, there's probably a conflict of interest and it would seem obvious, but we have to actually openly state it. Yeah. The issue, though, is that it's not that way offline. Like, I can do a podcast episode uh, on a medical device that I believe in, um, in, in I, I always talk about it. Like, I invented a surgical instrument. So, uh, I'm not going to get on. I've never gotten on a podcast and said, oh, my surgical instrument's the best. You know, you should buy it and tell your doctor to buy it. You know, I don't do that. Um, but, you know, but I could, in theory, do that. And I could, in theory, start talking about bone stimulators or any other thing, you know, anti-inflammatories, any specific drug, I could talk about it all I want on my podcast and I could get away with it. And this happens in reviews too. So the, the problem though, of course, is that if I'm talking about a, a, a drug or a medical device that I have, I don't own stock in the company, they don't sponsor me, they didn't send it to me for free. It's completely believable of what my review is. If I write a review on running shoes and I say, um, you know, I bought these running shoes. This is what I run in. This is why I believe in them. This is why they work for me. It's a, probably a valid review and, it, and it's helpful. But when runners read reviews and the company has sponsored their podcast and the listener doesn't know it, when they've sent you know, a year's supply of uh, nutritional supplement to the podcast reviewer and they, you know, or host or the gear reviewer, whoever it is, and the person reading the review doesn't know that, they don't really understand that they're getting biased information. And as I understand it, um, in the, I guess, you know, uh, exercise community, outdoor gear review community, however you want to phrase it, that stuff is pretty rampant, that it does happen a lot. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it seems like obviously you can go on Instagram and you see some picture of somebody that has a million followers and, you know, and there she is like stretching on a, you know, in a beautiful scenery in the background, there's like this can of, uh, you know, nutritional supplement in the foreground, like, oh, really, you brought that outside to stretch? I mean, you know, it's, it's just, there's such a, a, a huge amount of conflict in all of these re reviews that we rely on to make decisions. And uh, I'm curious about like, 
you know, is that, you know, how that p applies to blister and uh, how blister really does differ from some of these other gear review sites that we rely on for our information when we're making gear purchases. Yeah. So couple, couple ways to answer the question. One, um, uh, a massive point of differentiation, I think, between Blister and a lot of review publications in the ski world, in the mountain bike world, in the running world, is we don't accept any advertising money from any of the gear manufacturers we review. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's, again, especially when you're looking at um, a lot of the mainstream publications, but mostly it is definitely fair to say most publications. They're making the vast majority of their money off of advertising revenue from the gear manufacturers. Right. So, you know, the way this works is um, really, and, and this is the entire reason I started Blister, to be honest, was... I just think that's a really messed up thing to do in the sense of, um, on the one hand, we are all members of these different communities, right? The running community, the ski community, the bike community, the climbing community. To then turn around and effectively lie to our communities about whether the equipment that we all use to go do these sports is actually any good yeah because company x or company y is paying us i just was like i i'm um i'm not okay with that world at all i'm not okay with that business model mm -hmm. and um you know um that's a hell of a thing for to for us as a, as a point of differentiation and it's a hell of a thing to do to start off doing a company that way where you're just like, yeah, we're going to, I mean, talk about tying both of your hands behind your back or something. Yeah. It's like, yeah, we're just from day one. We're not going to make our money that way. Yeah. And, um, and so the whole founding principle of Blister was we want to create a space where people can come read our reviews and we're hopefully going to become the, uh, the most trusted source of information we're going to go very in depth and we're going to just try to be accurate about what you're getting and what you're not with a given product and at that point um you know and and no one has to come in and wonder if the reason that we're saying this shoe is great is tied to some advertising right deal um so let's just like let's eliminate that that conflict of interest and just create a credible space now, the only other thing I want to add to that is it's one thing to not have a reven have revenue streams that sort of undermine the credibility of your reviews mm -hmm. and we've worked hard to keep that in place. We don't we our revenue streams don't undermine the credibility of our reviews. Yeah. The other thing though that I think is often sort of not appreciated enough is I'll just, I'll say it maybe a little stronger, maybe not. Most people aren't good at writing reviews, yeah. full stop. Right. And it has nothing to do with like how good of a runner you are or how good of a skier you are. Um, I, in my experience, having done this for 10 years now, most people are not good reviewers. And, um, you know, so I think that it's one thing to eliminate a conflict of interest with revenue streams it's a whole nother thing to like be like that person or that publication or both the individual reviewer and the entity that they're sort of reviewing for are they actually good at this yeah and that is something that we've been thinking about day in and day out for me about 100 hours a week how how do you write a truly useful review what are the elements? What should be in place? What shouldn't be in place? And honestly, I think that this is something that, aside from the massive thing about the rampant conflict of interests there are in terms of funding and the rest for a lot of review publications, um, sometimes people just aren't good reviewers. Yeah. And I think I would love to see 
um, runners and mountain bikers and skiers get a little more attuned to that. Like, what are they? So they're saying this is a great shoe or the shoe sucks. Why? Like, what are they actually telling me? How are they actually spelling this out? And Mm -hmm. I think way too often we live in a world where, you know, some publication is like, this is the shoe of the year or the ski of the year. And it's like, what does that even mean? Like, unless that is a good running shoe or a good ski for you, why do you care? Right. So those are some of the things that I I hope that we've maybe um, been able to get a lot of different members of the outdoor community thinking a bit more critically about not just, oh, well, this publication said this is great or this is trash. What did they actually say? Right. Right. And yeah, that's what we've been up to. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's it you it, everybody blister the whole concept, the whole company, the whole way everything is presented is just so different from the industry standard, and yeah. uh, you know, and there's like one of my favorite quotes is it's very difficult to get a man to understand something when his livelihood depends upon him not understanding it, yep. and the range of conflicts of interest can be so insidious, you know, yeah. and I, I went through this interesting time where you know, when I was in school, when I started residency was the period when the, the attempts to sort of phase out conflicts of interest in medicine was underway. And so it went from this period of where literally drug companies, uh, medical device manufacturers were flying, not only physicians, but sometimes their spouses, sometimes their entire families to resorts, um, you know, to across to Europe to go to, uh, you know, trips to Germany, um, go skeet shooting, you know, in the Midwest, all kinds of different things. And that is strictly prohibited now, you know? Um, and, and then there's this undercurrent of sponsorship where you think, Oh, well, I'm not going to let that influence me, but I did lots of research and I've worked as a peer reviewer for the American college of foot and ankle surgeons and the American podiatric medical association. So I'm supposed to read and look for conflicts of interest in peer reviewed articles that are going to be submitted for publication. Yeah. And that's obvious, right? You'd think, But it's also, there's an incredible body of literature published in medical journals about how uh, conflicts and contributions from these companies can actually influence the medical provider's decision making. And most people don't think that. We think we're above all that. Well, listen, so the reason I tell you all that stuff is I went through this period. I actually researched it. I did research. I started clinical trials. I won a bunch of awards for research. Uh, all that kind of stuff. I'm on the board of directors of the International Foot and Ankle Foundation. And I thought because of my background and because of my training, I would not be influenced in that way in my own practice. Well, then I had this really formative experience when I was first in practice. I had won this award from the American Podiatric Medical Association for some research I did. Hmm. And the drug rep for this one company and basically uh, came to my office and he said, you know, we, we, and it basically it started, of course, with flattery, like, oh, you know, you're the guy, you won this award. So you're like the guy on this topic. And, you know, of course I was new in practice and like, oh, how flattering. How did he figure that out? You know? And, uh, and he said, well, you know, we, I said, well, I don't use that drug though. That's like a thousand dollars a dose. No offense to you, but I know these other drugs cost a fraction of that and work just as well. And so when I put people in the hospital, I don't give them that drug. And he's like, no, 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 no. You misunderstand. We're not trying to change your prescribing patterns. We're not trying to tell you what to do. We just think you're an expert. So what we'd like to do is once a quarter, we'd like to have you give a talk for the local um, doctors in the community. And we'll arrange it, you know, at a nice restaurant. We'll get a conference room. um, And basically, we'll pay you $5,000 just to give a one-hour talk while they eat dinner. And I was like, well, you know. That sounds very flattering, but I actually, because of all the research I've read, I think that would influence my prescribing behavior. And he said, but, well, but why? You seem like a smart guy. That shouldn't affect you. And I was thinking, okay, well, in theory it shouldn't, but I'm not going to do the talks. So I refused the money. I didn't do the talks. Now I'm not making this up. Like a week later, there was a guy that came in. I had to admit him to the hospital and he was actually a candidate for that drug. And it was like almost an outer body of experience where I was on the phone calling in his orders, all verbal orders, because he was going to be admitted to the hospital. And I actually said, hey, do you have this on formulary? And I actually asked if they had that drug and I never prescribed it, but just because they had basically offered me 
you know, 5,000 bucks to do a one hour talk several times a year. And I was very flattered by all of it. I was still thinking like, I have this, you know, need to reciprocate in some way. And I need, just because they offered it to me, I should probably put this guy on this drug that I didn't ever use anyway. Yeah. And so, you know, no matter how good you are at writing reviews, if you're given all of this equipment, you can't possibly have it not influence your reviews. And so I think it's amazing that Blister really has taken this approach of like, you know, from day one, we're not going to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's costly, truthfully, right? Like financially, it's harder to make money if you don't take free money. Simple as that. Yeah. Um, but there is nothing free. So there's a cost to it. And when your reviewer is getting something of value in exchange for contributing that review, it will influence the review. But you guys don't allow that to happen. So um, aside from all that conflict and everything, obviously, you guys know how to write reviews. And then we read those reviews. And, uh, and obviously, we see new gear come out. And, you know, regardless of what it is, whether it's a new shoe, a new, you know, GPS watch, uh, new skis, whatever, we always think that new is better. Mm-hmm. But I'm hoping that you can talk a little bit about that idea, just this concept of, you know, newer not always being better. Uh, yeah. And some example of that specifically in running gear. Yeah. Well, the biggest thing I think there is this, you know, I think we, a lot of us are susceptible to the shiny new object type of thing. And um, that's kind of understandable, I suppose. And, um, you know, anytime there's a new product release, companies are sure talking about why this new thing is so much better than the thing a year ago that they were telling you was amazing. Right. And I think that the, again, a critical thing that I hope that we're doing a decent job of at Blister is just reminding people that the, the real question is um, there are a few products where it's just like, is it good or is it bad? It's like, that's just not sophisticated enough thinking about these things. And, you know, the big thing, like if you and I were talking about, you know, let's say you contacted me and you're like, hey, this company's coming out with this running shoe. What do you guys think? Well, if I wrote you back and was just like, it's great. And you're like, okay, cool. I'll get it. I I would frankly be like, you're not that smart. I mean, like, Just because I said it's good. And so what we try to do in our reviews, and certainly we have a Blister membership where um, people from all around the world kind of email us and want to have these kind of direct personal gear recommendations from us. And basically the whole thing is like, you know, if somebody's wondering if a new product is better, quote unquote, better or worse than the previous one, it's like, Mostly that answer depends on who you are and what you're looking for Mm -hmm. and what you want or don't want, you know, from a given product. And so that's how we spend, that's how we spend a ton of our time at Blister talking from people around the world to try to help like line up with them, you know, and so, and so the answer isn't, is the new thing like better or worse than the old that is a hundred percent contingent on who you are right. and what you want and what yeah. you need. And this is just not how any of this stuff is ever presented. Right. Right. So, you know, I'll talk about just, um, a shoe that, um, that I like, I, the, um, the ultra Escalante, um, I actually do spend most of my time running in the, um, the Escalante racer, because I am somebody who just happens to like a firmer, a firmer soul, a firmer ride. And what happened when, so I'm going, we're getting specific because you asked me to. Right. But so that Escalante racer, which in a way, ultra markets as their marathon shoe. And I'm like, I promise I've never run a marathon in my life. I'm not sure if I ever will. But that is my training shoe because it offers the right level of kind of support and firmness and that ride characteristic that just tends to make my knees and my Achilles happiest. But then Ultra sells, um, they make just their kind of regular Escalante. And that is a cushier ride. Um, 
quite a bit more so than the Ultra Escalante Racer. And they came out with an Escalante and then, you know, did an update on it. And there is a difference now in terms of how soft or squishy that ride feels. And I can absolutely imagine that some people are going to want to, they're going to gravitate toward and feel more comfortable in that squishier ride. Mm -hmm. Others are going to feel more comfortable in that firmer ride. So again, is the new better? Totally depends on who you are and what you want and what you're looking to do. And that's something that we spend a whole bunch of time in any of our reviews, regardless of the product, trying to help people understand like what they're getting and what they're not in a given mm -hmm. product. Right. And that's really interesting. And it is true. It's like everybody, you know, people want like what they think of as personal information and input just because they asked a question. Yeah. Um, and they want this sort of, it's almost, it's like this weird thing where we want very specific advice, but in a very quick way because of this sort of like, you know, instant gratification of being able to find any piece of information you want instantly on the internet. And yeah. I got a, a, an email from someone recent, recently who sent a very brief description and said, last sentence was, I think, you know, based on the information I've provided to you, can you tell me which of these conditions I most likely have? Well, the short answer is, yeah, I can make a guess, but that'd be a really irresponsible thing to do um, because I would never in a million years like go see somebody face to face or get on a webcam call with them and hear that information, not ask them questions to clarify, and make sure that I knew what was right for them. Yeah. And it's true with reviews. You're trying to find out what is certainly right for you, not maybe right for you. Yeah. You know, nobody with a broken neck would want to know, hey, should I just do this one thing? Yeah. Like, hey, man, you need to make sure your neck heals and that you actually don't become paralyzed. So we need to make sure we do exactly the right thing, not sort of the right thing. And if you're going to train for Western States 100, you probably want shoes that are definitely the right ones for you, not maybe the right ones for you. So when people go and start reading reviews, like how can you, I mean, I guess how can you, as a re, somebody who's re, like assessing reviews and trying to critically review that review that's being presented to you for the information, like us as sort of novice reviewers of reviews, you know, trying to make an assessment of whether or not this information is accurate. What are some sort of base things that you can recommend to people as they're reading these different reviews from different sources yeah. as being either valuable or total garbage or somewhere in between? Yeah. Okay. I'm glad you asked. Uh, first of all, one thing I personally just loathe in product reviews and i guess we'll go more specific we'll, we'll you want to keep it to running reviews in particular well, here well it doesn't matter i mean i'm just interested because i mean i, I don't know any runners that only run yeah yeah, you know, yeah i mean i climb i you know ski yeah. i i like let's, to be outside uh and so you know i've done lots of things i'm gonna keep this specific to running reviews but all everything i'm gonna say translates to all these other okay areas um I hate flower, flowery language in reviews when it's kind of clear that the author of the review is like a failed poet or something. <laughs> it's like, I'm sorry that you were bad at creative writing or no one like purchased your novel. So to me though, it just seems like when people are coming to read a product review to figure out if they ought to spend a bunch of money on this running shoe or that running shoe, if and when I get the sense that what this reviewer is mostly trying to do is just some exercise in creative writing, mm. um, you're gonna lose my attention pretty quickly because I don't actually, I don't actually think that you're somebody that I want to be going to as a source of consumer product information. Right. Um, another thing is, man look at the rampant use of cliches in running shoe reviews. Yeah. Um, you know, and one of the things I always tell our crew at Blister um, is cliches are obstacles to thinking. Mm. And so here, here's a classic example. Go read 10 running shoe reviews. We can make a drinking game out of this. <laughs> Take a shot every time you read the word responsive. Yeah, right. What the hell does the word responsive mean? Exactly. Right? And yep. I think that when you start 
to look at certain terms that just get used again and again and again, I think there is a very real thing about stopping ourselves and being like, what does that actually mean? And are they giving us a sense in the review? And, and often in these running shoe reviews, we find that people are, the reviews are, are saying like literally contradictory information. Like it's super soft and cushiony yet responsive. Yeah. It's like, nope, you, you get to pick one there. Right. Right. Um, and so for the most part, what we try to do is I just tell our people, like, you don't get to use the word responsive. Yeah, no, that's a good rule. <laughs> think through, like, think your way around the lazy default cliched terms that are just everywhere in these running shoe reviews. And if you can't articulate what you're trying to say without defaulting back to these kind of empty terms, then you need to think harder about what you haven't gotten there. You haven't gotten there as a reviewer, as a writer, as somebody who's trying to provide consumer product information. So those are all things we do. Another key thing is that you will often find in running shoe reviews, there is no other mention of another product, mm. right? Because we're trying to keep all the advertisers happy. So you're not going to say shoe X from company Y is a hundred times better if this is what you're looking for right. than this terrible shoe that's marketed in the same way. So I think one of the, the truly helpful things to do is to try to locate the product that we're reviewing and talking about and kind of triangulate around. So if we're talking about Altra's new Escalante, we want to talk about exactly how that thing stacks up against the previous model, mm. right? Or if you're talking about a category of everybody talks about every company out there has that shoe in their lineup that they're kind of calling their more minimalist offering. Mm -hmm. And what we've certainly found is one company's minimalist is another company's maximalist. Right. So again, without providing that kind of context and locating the product, if you're not getting that from a review, um, run away. Yeah. You know, and frankly, yeah. I'll go one step further, run away because there's a high likelihood that they're just trying to appease the company either because there's an advertising deal in place or they just want to appease the company. Yeah. But man, we've reviewed shoes where it's like, this is our most minimalist offering. And it's like for someone who's actually looking for a more minimalist shoe, this thing is a boat. Right. So, yeah, there, there is a lot of that. And, you know, the question I get most often from doctors and runners is what shoe do you run in? And I, 99% of the time, I don't even answer them because I'm like, I run in the best shoes for me for that particular type of run. That's what I do. And I know which ones are best for me. And that's what I pick. It's probably not going to work for you. So I'm not going to tell you because you'll be dumb enough to go buy it anyway, yeah. just because I use it, you know, yeah. and you think it's going to be your ticket to no injuries and overtraining. And it's crazy. You know, like I, I did, um, most of the Ironman races I did I actually use the uh, Kinvara mm -hmm. and the Kinvara is definitely their minimalist like shoe, right? It's low drop. It's very, very lightweight. And the reviews, when I got it, most of those reviews had said things like you shouldn't run more than a half marathon in these. Well, I was doing Ironmans in them. And, but you're, this is like a great example of what you just mentioned because it is, it is a minimalist shoe, right? It is a low drop heel. It does have, you know, no medial posting and it's fairly lightweight and all that, but it is very cushy compared to what I think of as a true minimalist shoes. It has lots of EVA cushioning. It is pretty soft. You know, yeah, it has torsional flexibility and stuff, but it's not really a minimalist minimalist shoe. That's for sure. And, uh, and if it's somebody who really is looking for a true minimalist shoe, that's probably not the one they're looking for. But if you're looking for a more minimalist shoe to do some runs like that, you know, longer races, it's certainly minimalist for long races um, if you're not really a minimalist runner. But again, it's like by comparing it to other shoes, you get a sense of what that really means. But talking in, about that shoe by itself, you don't really get that picture. It just does not put it in context. And that's really important. Yeah. So uh, I know Blister really is the place for people to get honest reviews for outdoor gear, for running, you know, trail running stuff, all this stuff. Um, and uh, I'm sure they're going to all check it out. But I'm also hoping you can share some information about your show 
uh, and you know, what people can expect when they listen to your podcast. Mm. We're talking about for off the couch. Yeah. Yeah. Specifically yeah. off the couch. Yeah. I know you guys have a bunch of different shows, but off the couch in particular. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that, I mean, there's, there's podcasts like yours that I think do such a good job of helping people understand, right? Like this is how we're either thinking about rehab or looking at prevention. And to be honest, we don't spend the bulk of our time doing that. Yeah. Um, that might be um, an episode here or there, or might, that might come in the context of talking with a sort of normal everyday runner, like, um, you know, or, or somebody who is an elite runner. And um, so it's, I, it's kind of a running variety show. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I've never said it that way before in my life, but maybe that's not the worst way to think of it. All and, right. uh, and like, like we said, we, we kind of like to think of it as the running podcast for people who maybe hate running or aren't sure they like running, um, or maybe love it some days. Um, so yeah, that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do. No, I think it's a great show. We'll certainly have links to it in the show notes that anybody can listen to. So, you know, if you go to docontherun.com, go to this uh, particular show under the podcast tab, you can certainly get those links. It'll take them there also to Blister as well. Uh, but I know there are lots of different places where you're found. Uh, and I'm just curious, like when, when you tell people to follow you on social, to come find you, to listen to your show, to go to Blister, where, do you, where should they go? Yeah, I mean, so the the website itself is blisterreview.com. Uh, Instagram handle, the same, blisterreview, um, at blisterreview. Uh, Facebook, I think, is just blister, you'll find us. Um, but yeah, those are some of the some of the best spots. Yeah, I think you'll you you go to any of those, you'll you'll get us. Excellent. Well, we'll make sure we have all those links in the show notes. So listen, Jonathan, I'm really grateful you could take time out of your schedule. I know um, you're probably itching to be outside right now, uh, <laughs> but instead you're here sharing all your expertise with us. And I really appreciate it. I know that you provide a lot of valuable insight into how we can actually look at reviews, find reviews that are actually useful instead mm -hmm. of ones that are, uh, I guess, entertaining in the romance novel sense of the, the review. Right. You know? Uh, yeah, but, you know, we need... We need or, to be able to make decisions. Yeah, I mean, that's just it. it and it, it, is, it is interesting because it is so tempting. Like I um, recently in, interviewed someone else for the show and um, I went to her website and, you know, she's sponsored by uh, obviously one of the GPS watch companies. And it's so fascinating to me because I understand this stuff and I, let, I literally was making sure that the links were correct. And I clicked on it and I was like, oh, I could use a new GPS watch. Like... Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's just, we are inherently susceptible to those things. And we go looking for reviews. We have to have reviews we can rely on. And, uh, you know, so I'm glad that you've come on the show. You've been able to talk about Blister and of course, all the work you're doing to make sure that we have reliable reviews that we can draw on to make our purchases in a way that isn't really relying on biased information. So listen, thanks again. I'm really grateful that you could do this and you came on the show today. Well, thanks very much. This has been fun. Good to talk. All right, you as well. So have a great day. Thank you. You too. Doc on the run. We help injured runners run.